nine months ago, I created my first video in what has become an ongoing Herculean quest to explain all of Five Nights at Freddy's with science. I've made eight videos on it since then, and I have to say, in this journey, I think I've increased my knowledge of FNAF lore tenfold. Which, admittedly, isn't saying a whole lot, because I was a real noob when I started. I mean, that first video is riddled with mistakes. I constantly referred to Spring Bonnie as Golden Bonnie. I was blissfully ignorant to the subtle differences between book canon and game canon, and I completely forgot that Henry existed. However, more than any of that, there was one correction that I've gotten over and over and over and over. To this day, I still get comments about this. In that first video, I made a two-second joke about how this character doesn't have a name. And droves of people crawled out of the woodwork and cried out in one voice with righteous fury, his name is Evan. It's gotten to the point where if anyone ever comments the word Evan on any of my videos, it will instantly get removed. That's how many comments I've gotten. They range from very casual tips, hey man, just let me you know uh, his name is Evan, to long messages in all caps telling me that I need to do my research. But here's the thing, I have done my research. And I was right. I'm a proud believer in the scientific method, so today we're doing a little theory review and proving that the crying child's name is not Evan or Michael, or Springtrap, or anything else. I'm usually not a very negative person, but I'm about to dunk on some haters. Richard, hit that intro. The three theories that we're gonna be talking about today all relate to this thing, the Foxy Grid. For context, back in 2017, the Five Nights at Freddy's survival logbook was released. On the surface, it seems like a pretty standard puzzle book filled with word searches and would you rathers and FNAF trivia, the kind of thing that your dad would bring to the beach for decades until it's literally falling apart. I have no idea if that's a relatable reference to anyone else, but uh, it's real. But of course, this is an official piece of FNAF merchandise, so you already know it's got an insane amount of hidden lore in the most obscure little details that nobody would ever think to look at. It turns out that this puzzle book isn't a book of puzzles, but it is a puzzle that's also a book which is filled with smaller puzzles, in which piecing together the little hints and clues across its pages will get you the answers to some of this series' biggest questions. Like the fact that this kid's name is Cassidy, or that the character named Mike and the character named Michael are actually the same person. I realize it really doesn't sound that impressive when I spell it out like that. That's, I mean, we should have seen that coming. By now, this book is over six years old, and the fandom has basically torn the whole thing apart for secrets. And yet, after all that time, there is still one puzzle that has gone unsolved. On page 95, there is a grid with numbered rows and columns, and you're asked to draw an 8-bit version of Foxy. Seems innocent enough, but if you squint a little bit, you'll notice a very faint A, B, C written in the first three boxes. So the logical step would be to continue the alphabet from there, and if you do that, then you get this, a grid of letters with numbered rows and columns. Great! Now what? It's pretty clear that this grid is designed for you to take two numbers, find the intersection, and get a letter. The trouble is, no one knows what numbers to use. 
Though no official solution to this puzzle has ever been given, many have tried to claim the glory of being the first to solve the infamous Foxy Grid. The most popular solution among the fanbase is, of course, the Evan Theory. As far as I can tell, this solution originates from a Reddit post by Wolfie170Kingdom on the Five Nights at Freddy's subreddit. Let's break down their methods. It's pretty widely accepted that there are three different characters communicating through this book. There's Cassidy, the ghost kid that I mentioned earlier, who communicates with faded text on the pages. There is another spirit character who communicates by physically altering the text on the end of night surveys, where the book asks you to rate your feelings on a scale from 1 to 10 at the end of each chapter. So, for example, on page 109, this is supposed to read purpose, but it's been changed to read I'm scared. We don't know this person's name, but based on lines like, it was for me, most people think that this is supposed to be the spirit of William Afton's son, our infamous crying child. And lastly, there's the previous owner of the book who's doodled all over it in red pen. We were able to puzzle together that this character's name is Mike because, well, he wrote his name in the front of the book. There are two characters named Mike in this series. There's Mike Schmidt, the player character from FNAF 1. Uh, Mom, I know you watched this and you don't know a lot about FNAF lore. That was Josh Hutcherson from the FNAF movie. And then there's Michael Afton, the son of William Afton and the player character from Sister Location. However, it's heavily implied throughout the whole series and in this very book that Mike Schmidt and Mike Afton are actually the same person. So yeah, suffice to say, this book was almost certainly owned by Michael Afton. Either that, or it's a completely new third character also named Mike, which would be very dumb. So to recap, three people. Cassidy writes in faded text, Mike writes in red pen, and Mike's younger brother changes the print. Got it? So according to this Reddit post, the altered text from the crying child isn't just random statements. They are responding to specific questions posed by Cassidy throughout the book. And if you plug in all the page numbers where those questions are from into the Foxy Grid, then you'll get the name of the crying child. On page 89, the crying child says, I can hear sounds, which according to the post is in response to page 75, where Cassidy asks, does he still talk to you? So if you go over seven and down five, you get the letter E. Continuing with that same logic, it was for me on page 89 responds to the party was for you on page 103. I can't see responds to what do you see on page 59, and finally, I'm scared on page 109 responds to nothing. If you comb through all the faded text, none of it makes sense as something that would prompt the response, I'm scared. According to the Reddit post, that's because it's not responding to some faded text. Instead, it's responding to the book itself on page 47 when it asks you to rate your feelings. How are you feeling? I'm scared. 4-7 gets you the letter N, and boom, you've got the name Evan. It works perfectly. I mean, it's almost too good to be true. And that's because it is. To understand why this solution and all the others in this book probably aren't the intended answer, I think it's a good idea to first talk a bit about puzzle design. When you're designing an esoteric puzzle like this without any explicit instructions, it's important that the rules for solving it remain exactly the same throughout the whole thing. To understand why, let's look at a math puzzle. I promise it'll be fun. Say I give you a list of four numbers. One, two, three, five. And you need to find the pattern. Looking at the first three, it might seem easy. You just go up one each time. So one to two, two to three, it works. But if you look at the last number, you'll see that this logic doesn't actually hold up. 
If the rule were adding one every single time, then the next number should be four, but it's actually five. This tells you that this solution is wrong. The rule that you have doesn't work everywhere, so it can't be correct. You couldn't do something like say, you have to add one every time, except for the last one, you need to add two arbitrarily. The same rules apply to this puzzle. In order for a solution to be for sure correct, it needs to be a clearly defined rule that applies exactly the same everywhere. As a general rule of thumb, if you need to use the word except in your solution, you should probably go back to the drawing board. The Evan solution is based on the rule that every altered line responds to a piece of faded text, but the last one does not respond to faded text. It doesn't follow the established rule. Therefore, this solution probably isn't valid. If that was the intended solution of this puzzle, that's incredibly sloppy on the part of the puzzle designers because we have no way of knowing if we've gotten the right answer or not. Also, for those curious about the number puzzle I just laid out, there is a real solution, and I'll let you try and figure it out and pin the first comment that gets it right. For a little hint, it really should look more something like this. But if that wasn't enough to convince you that this solution probably isn't right, let's take a closer look at that last letter. According to the theory, the line, I'm scared, is responding to feelings on tonight's shift from page 47. The problem? The line, feelings on tonight's shift, also appears verbatim on pages 25, 67, 89, and 109, it's the exact same wording on every single end of night survey. So how are we supposed to know that we need to use the one on page 47 specifically? Well, according to the original post, it's because they already had the letters EVA and were working backwards to get the name Evan to work. But by this solution's logic, the kid's name could be Evig or Eva or Evid, and all of those names would be equally valid. There's also a ton of faded messages that never go answered. On page 20, Cassidy asks, what do you remember? Page 23 asks, was your favorite childhood toy a plastic purple telephone? Kind of random. Page 41 asks, do you have dreams? And page 31 literally asks, do you remember your name? Which, you know, in a puzzle that's supposedly supposed to reveal the name of the crying child, Seems like it probably should have come into play. Unless, of course, we've been overthinking this this whole time, and that's what the line, I'm scared, is responding to. Do you remember your name? I'm scared. Hello, scared. I'm dead. So based on all that, the inconsistent application of the rules, the ignoring of pieces that don't fit as cleanly, and the cherry picking of numbers that gets you an answer that makes sense, I think I've made my case. Is the name Evan definitely wrong? No, not necessarily. But if this was the intended solution to reveal this information to us, again, it's incredibly sloppy. And based on the other puzzles and level of detail included in this book, I find that a little hard to believe. So to all the millions of you trying to tell me that this kid's name is Evan, next time, do your research. Vindication! Whew, man, that, that one felt good, I'm not gonna lie. But while we're here, let's look at a couple more popular solutions and see if they hold up. That last one was pretty long, so I'll do this next one quick. I've seen people say that the first step is to actually draw Foxy in the grid. Kind of weird that none of us thought to just do what the page said, but if you match the foxy at the bottom of the page pictogram style, then count all the page numbers where the phrase my name appears in faded text, skipping over any block that you colored in, then you'll get an anagram for the name is Springtrap. Put it all together and you'll get my name is Springtrap. Sounds pretty compelling. We already know that Springtrap is an actual character in the series. It's a real word. We didn't need to change the rules at all. And there's absolutely no world where this is right. First of all, there's a ton of 
personal interpretation involved in drawing out Foxy. The logic seems to be sort of like a CAPTCHA, just select any box where Foxy appears, but then there are some boxes that should be colored in that aren't like the tuft of hair on the top of his head. Uh, his ears also get cut off at the top of the page, so how do you know like how far down you're supposed to put him? There's just too many questions for this to be a thing they expected us to do accurately. And from a more meta level, this book was designed to help us solve unanswered questions about the lore. So if the answer really was supposed to be, my name is Springtrap, what does that even mean? Who's Springtrap? The crying child? Cassidy? Neither of those make any sense. We've known since FNAF 3 that William Afton, aka the purple guy, is Springtrap. We literally watched it happen. There was never any question. Uh, heck, we knew the name Springtrap before FNAF 3 even came out. From a puzzle making perspective, what would be the point of making a super hard and very subjective puzzle just to give us some information that we all already know? So yeah, safe to say, the case of the Foxy Grid remains open. I bet there are dozens of proposed solutions to this thing, but from what I've found, the other big one that's been gaining lots of traction lately comes from a Reddit post on the Game Theory subreddit by FunnyGuy13 and a YouTube video by OmegaX, both of which seemingly came to this solution independently of one another. That already sets off a light in my head that maybe they might actually be onto something here. So let's dive in deep. Unlike the previous two, this theory proposes that the solution lies not with the faded text, but with Mike's drawings. In addition to responding to some of the questions and playing some of the puzzles, Mike doodles all over the margins of this book in his signature red pen. Well, according to this theory, if you use the page numbers where each doodle appears and the number associated with the drawing as our two numbers to plug into the Foxy Grid, then you'll find the big revelation that this book was hiding. Let's break them all down. Page 14 has 10 tally marks. Page 52 has four arrows. Page 31 has a group of five tallies and a group of nine tallies. Page 73 has the word power written out and underlined, which has five letters. Page 87 has one foxy. Page 39 has one grave. Page 100 has five tallies. Page 101 has three keys. And page 108 has 11 minutes. If you plug all of those into the grid where the page number is across and the drawing item number is down, then you'll get this random jumble of letters. Unscramble it and you get the phrase, it's Michael. And as I'm sure we've all figured out by now, Michael is a very important name in the FNAF franchise. The proud owner of this book is none other than Michael Afton. Hooray, everyone! Shout it from the rooftops. The Foxy Grid has been solved. Except it hasn't. This solution sounds great, so long as I don't mention all the drawings that it doesn't work for. This book is absolutely littered with drawings, and by my count, this solution only utilizes about half of them. There are five tallies on page nine, five more tallies on page 36, two bongos on page 34, one nightmare on page 41, so how are we supposed to know which drawings go with this puzzle and which ones are just drawings? Well, according to the original post, all of those are excluded because their pages have no page numbers on them. The logic here is that Mike is the one leaving these clues, and since he's a real person, he's able to physically interact with the book. He's able to write all over it in his red pen, and if you look closely on these four pages, the corner with the page number seems to have been torn out or covered up. This theory would suggest that this is Mike's way of letting us, the readers, know that we shouldn't use these pages. Sort of begs the question why the designers of the book would even include drawings on these pages to begin with if we're not supposed to use them. Seems a little mean-spirited and needlessly confusing, but I mean, this is also FNAF we're talking about, so I guess I'm the idiot for expecting anything else. So you know what? I'll bite. 
To lay it all out, the logic of this solution is that you use the number associated with the red drawing and the page numbers to get the letters, but you need to skip any drawing where the page number has been purposely obscured, because there's no page number. As long as every single letter in It's Michael follow these rules to a T, then we've got an honest to goodness solution on our hands. So just to be sure, let's go through each letter one at a time to confirm and it doesn't work. For starters, there are drawings with clear numbers associated with them and visible page numbers that still aren't included. There's three hearts on page 16, one Fazbear logo on page 62, three ghosts on page 84, and page 92 has two baskets of exotic butters. Thank you, hand unit. The original posters reason that these aren't included either because they're responding to something on the page, not a part of the puzzle, or they have some other lore significance. But trying to determine which pictures are lore relevant and which ones are only present as part of the puzzle seems way too subjective for something they expect the community to be able to solve. So already I'm suspicious, but of these 10 drawings that are included, there are two that don't quite fit as cleanly as the rest. According to the original post, there is a drawing of one foxy on page 87, which gets you the letter I. However, if you go to page 87, you'll see that there is no drawing of foxy, just the phrase, for the glory of pizza, written out next to a picture of a pirate Bonnie. I actually reached out to Omega X, the original poster of the video on this, and they admitted that this one is a bit of a stretch, but on the previous page, they ask you who would win in a fight with a bunch of FNAF characters, one of the matchups being Foxy versus Bonnie. They made the connection that Bonnie represents Willie Mafton, the purple guy in the bunny suit, and Foxy represents Michael, the kid in the Foxy mask. For the glory of pizza is Michael commenting on that battle, a battle that in real life, Michael won. Hence, Foxy won. Can you make sense of it? I mean, I guess, but now we're deep into the Evan N territory where you're just trying to justify this clue to get an answer that makes sense. Also, the rule that we established in the beginning was that we only use the drawing. If we look at the messages too, then you could make that same type of argument for basically anything in here. On page 37, he mentions that part of his workout is a five mile run. On page 85, he highlights the numbers 10 and 11 in red. On page one, he crosses out the word security and writes survival. Each one has eight letters. When you make that sort of allowance for one part of the book, you need to make those same allowances everywhere else. Again, the rules need to be consistent everywhere or we'd never know when we had the right answer. The other letter I want to call into question is from page 108, where he writes 811 as the time of some unknown incident report. We use the 11 minutes to get the letter L, but what about the eight hours? By that same logic, shouldn't we do 108 across and 8 down to get the letter G? The original theory argues that because we're using the 11 minutes to get a letter, then we would need to convert the 8 hours into minutes to get 480 minutes, which is far too long to fit on the grid, so you skip it, but why would that be something that we would assume we had to do? I mean, there are so many easier and better ways for the designers to communicate the number 11 to us, why would they rely on us figuring out that we needed to do dimensional analysis for this one? But in addition to all those technical reasons, just from a storytelling perspective, what information is the phrase, it's Michael, even giving us? Both posts state that it confirms that the original owner of this book is Michael Apton from Sister Location, but here's the thing. This book already confirms that several times. Page 92 has a drawing of the exotic butters. 
page 34 has some casual bongos drawn next to a picture of baby which is a reference to one of the musical tracks from sister location uh, both of these things could only be drawn by someone who was in the sister location bunker and the only person we know who was down there was michael afton but we also know that this is a Fazbear security logbook that's supposed to be owned by a FNAF security guard, which we know that Mike Schmidt was. And, oh yeah, there's the little detail that he wrote his name in the front of the book. You're telling me that the most difficult puzzle in the book is all to reveal that the two characters with the same name are in fact the same character. That, I mean, that's super lame. Of the three solutions I talked about today, It's Michael is by far the most compelling, but in the end, it's just got too many technicalities for it to be the intended solution on the part of the puzzle makers. Though, I do wanna applaud anyone who has ever tried to take a crack at this thing and propose their own solution. I mean, it seems like I'm being super nitpicky and negative, but I really am impressed with how close some of these solutions come. There's just a couple of pieces that don't fit right. And who knows, maybe the designers of this book did screw up and they just made a bad puzzle and I'm the idiot here trying to take it too seriously. And to be clear, I don't have a solution either. I'm gonna be keep picking this book apart over the next few weeks to see if I can find anything new, but let's be honest, far smarter and wiser people than I have tried and failed. And I'd be a fool to think that I could solve this thing alone. But if you are a fan of a channel dedicated to applying math and science to video games, chances are you're a pretty clever cat yourself. I can't solve this thing alone, but I can give you some of my observations, and maybe together, in the comments, we can be the ones to finally solve FNAF. All right, this video is getting way too long already, so I'll wrap this up. I put a couple of strange observations down in the comments, and I encourage you all to do the same thing. Too many people try and come up with a full answer themselves to gain the glory of being the one person to solve the Fox Grid, but I think if we all work together as a community, we've got a real decent shot at it. So if you have any ideas or observations, it doesn't have to be a fully formed thing, just, hey, I noticed this thing and it was kind of weird. Just throw it down there. Maybe somebody else will read that and they'll be like, whoa, I didn't notice that, but now I have this other idea. And if we keep doing that, we'll stumble into the right answer eventually. I'll be down there too, throwing ideas around and who knows, maybe sometime soon, you'll see a thumbnail saying, we solved the Foxy Grid. But until then, if I hear one more person tell me that it's Evan, I'm gonna lose it. A massive thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon, including Alakazam, Big Dog Ty for the win, Ethan Furlano, Star Joy, and Sherry and Mark. If we had to solve an esoteric puzzle to find your names, it would spell out rad. <laughs>